Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to welcome you all at today's panel discussion organized jointly by the Aspen Institute Prague and Prague 20. Uh, as usually, uh, we invited and brought to Prague three extremely interesting speakers. Uh, one of them being a person actually who uh, warned as early as uh, the beginning of 21st century before 2008 that things are not uh, going uh, as they should. So it will be extremely interesting, I guess, to hear not just from him, but uh, from the two uh, other speakers about uh, the origins of the crisis, uh, about uh, the changes it brought uh, to the international arena, and about the lessons uh, that uh, hopefully were learned. Uh, without further ado, uh, let me pass the floor uh, to Mr. Vladimir Dlouhi, the chairman of Prague 20, who will uh, introduce the speakers uh, in a greater detail and who will also act uh, as a moderator of today's discussion. So have a nice and interesting discussion. And uh, Mr. Dlouhi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Radek. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very glad that after some pause, we were able to renew the activities of uh, Prague 20 with the support of Aspen Institute. The last meeting we had was in other premises, just opposite the square with Jean-Claude Trichet. And I'm very glad that today we were able to bring another group of uh, first-class speakers, speakers who, are, who will be speaking about what we have learned from the recent financial and ensuing uh, global economic crisis. By means of introduction, let me provide you with a very short narrative. How did the biggest crisis, financial and economic crisis after Second World War emerged? Uh, there are many routes, but probably the good starting point is second half of 1990s, when after their crisis, the developing countries started to save instead to spend. They learned very painful lessons from their crisis, especially during 1998, and they said never again. And they started to create the reserves, started to, f to save. Japan at the same time was already in a quite deep slump. Oil-rich countries and later Germany started to generate surpluses of their trade balance, current account, and general balance of payments. So the question was, who will start to spend in the world economy so that the global economy does not go into the recession or substantial slowdown? And indeed, in the second half of 1990s, there was a substantial invest, uh, investment spree, namely by the corporations in the advanced economy into the information technologies. That led to the famous dot-com bubble in the 2000 and 2001, bubble bursting early 2000. Corporate businesses scaled down its investment dramatically, but Fed, the Federal Reserve bought a little bit of the drive. There was a sharp cut of interest rate but corporate businesses after the burst of dot-com bubble had too few incentives to restart the investment activity. But there immediately appeared a substitute for spending over the horizon, a famous US custom, uh, consumer. Low interest rate prompted houses purchases and surge in housing investment. And at the same time, due to the development of the sophisticated financial tools, Additional demand through large swathes of population with low credit rating obtain access to credit cards and general to the loans. Moreover, rising house prices allowed to avoid default because they allowed refinancing into low interest rate mortgages. And the globalization provided a source of massive credit. This has been substantially supported by the new role of sophisticated US financial sector and not only the US, securitization via the famous slicing and dicing, and all this helped globally to bridge the gap between over-consuming US and under-consuming more, more thrifty other parts of the world. But the whole system rested on the housing market, 
A, new housing construction and existing housing sales provided for jobs in construction, for economic activity in the real estate business, and namely in the financial sector, which earned a huge amount of revenues. And B, rising house prices provided for home equity to refinance old loans and finance new consumption. And before the crisis in 2007, it looked to be palatable for almost everybody. Foreign countries exported themselves out of the recession and at the same time provided, provided lending to the US to pay for those imports. And at the same time, they believed that they saved well their savings into the preferable investment. All this started to crumble in 2006 when Fed decided to raise the by-step interest rate. That almost immediately halted housing prices that serve as a loans collateral Mortgage-backed securities turn out to be backed by much more risky mortgages than previously believed. And suddenly the balance sheet of the banks turn out to have substantial portion of this highly rated by low quality securities. And on the top of it, holdings of this asset was financed with a huge amount of short-term debt. After that, creditors very quickly panicked, refute financing, banking sector appeared on the verge of collapse, and there was a need of the bailout, and the crisis burst, and the consequences we all know. It has been followed by the biggest slump in the economic activity after Second World War, be it in the United States or be it in the Europe. There are many questions to be answered. Why huge financial inflows into the US were used primarily for subprime credit? Why US was not able, like many other economies, probably Germany is the best example, to export its way from 2001 recession? Why were or still are poor economies finance, financing unsustainable, unsustainable consumption of rich countries? Why did Fed keep rates so low for such a long time? Why did financial firms make loans to people with no income? sometimes with no job. Where was the free market self-discipline and where was modern regulation? But mainly, why we all economists didn't see the crisis coming? The last question, it's almost like a post-mortem for pre-2007 profession of economics. However, there are definitely wider issues, not only the failure of the economists to consider. General political and social short-termism Globalization led to the rising income inequality for the job insecurity in the developed economies. Politicians, however, wanted to continue to drive the consumption, including housing, and the lending which appeared after 2002-2003 was just assuaging political pressures. There was a general fragility of global economy. Consumption-hungry debtors in advanced economies were facing export-oriented development economies, but inefficient domestic-oriented sector in the development ec uh, economies pushed for exporting. This all has been buttressed uh, politically and there were substantial flaws in international financial system. Inability to cope and adjust, adjust huge trade and balance of payment imbalancing. There was a clash of financial system, painful experience from the Asian 1998 crisis, slow down, Burden for growth stimulation after 2000 on the US solar. And most countries started to forget completely uh, about balance of pay payment imbalances. The crisis in 2008 and 2009 has been followed by the Euro crisis, but that's a different issue which we have discussed already in Prague 20. Is a crisis to much extent sui generis? We have seen solutions. Many banking and financial sector analysts speak about a recovery. I believe it's, uh, to some extent, false optimism. Yes, the world is going probably through the economic recovery in coming years 2014, 2015. Most notably US, to some extent, Europe is coming out of the recession. Developed country, develop, developing countries are facing much lower growth in their own problem, as we have just seen last Friday, when a combination of one particular decision in Argentina 
about, uh, about the foreign exchange combined with the big da data from China and given the fact that one of the global bond investment fund, PIMCO, is losing its, uh, its long-term famous CEO, El Arian, all this combined to the biggest fall of the market just within a few hours, just last Friday. There will be a correction, at least I'm convinced. But this clearly shows that despite that uh, analysts speak about the recovery, the world economy today is very fragile and weak. So the question we are facing today, what did we really learn, is very appropriate. And I'm very glad that at this occasion I can welcome our sp uh, three speakers. And without any other ado, I will start with the a, with a first speaker, who is William Roy White, or as we know him, Bill White. And uh, I will start with a very strong appreciation. Another top economist, Raghuram Rajan, who for the moment is uh, governor of Central Bank of India, has published a famous book, Fault Lines. And in the introduction, Mr. Rajan mentions four names of the economist who well before the start of the crisis were issuing uh, strong signals of warning. He mentions Kenneth Rogoff, he mentions Nouriel Roubini, he mentions Robert Schiller, and he mentions William White. So we have a person here today who already, and as one of the few, before the start of the crisis, knew probably much farther than most of us did. Bill was born in Canada, so he's a Canadian. He studied at the University of Manchester, where he learned his PhD after studying also, also in Canada. And it would take half of the today's conference time if I mention all uh, positions which he has assumed. He started to work at Bank of England, then he was in the Treasury of, uh, uh, in the Canadian Treasury, then he moved to the Bank of Canada, where he was uh, Deputy Chief of the Department of Monetary and Financial Analysis, and he was also the Deputy Governor of uh, Bank of Canada between 1988 and 1994. Then he was Economic Advisor and Head of the Monetary and Economic Department in the Bank of International Settlement, BIS, between 94 and 2008. And from 2009 till today, he's chairing the Economic Development and Review, Review Committee in OECD. But there is something I should learn from Bill. Despite the fact that he's such a famous economist, he uh, still assumes an important uh, position. He sometimes manages to live in Switzerland and enjoying his life. That's something what I indeed envy you. Anyway, Bill, thank you very much for coming here, and the floor is yours. Well, let, let me, let me uh, start. Let me uh, start by saying how pleased I am to be here. Uh, at Vladimir's invitation. I should tell you that I met him at, uh, in a hotel in Ottawa in 1990, just after the, the Velvet Revolution. Uh, and he was there with uh, Vaclav Klaus and uh, with a man who's now become a friend of mine, Joseph Tuchovsky. And I have to say that when I left that meeting, I was just enormously impressed, as indeed were all the others, uh, with the, the intellectual quality and the, the vigor and the ambitions of those people. Uh, so I'm, I'm very pleased to be here at his invitation today. Um, some of you may remember this quote of Don Rumsfeld's. Uh, do you remember where he said, um, uh, there are things we know we know, there are things we know we don't know, but there are things we don't know we don't know. So what you don't know can hurt you. Mark Twain actually got off what I thought was an even better line, and it's really gonna be the theme of what I'll be talking about today. Mark Twain said 100 years ago, it ain't what you don't know what gets you. It's what you know for sure what ain't so. False beliefs. And I think what I wanna suggest is that what got us into this crisis is false beliefs and to go back to the, the basic theme of this conference, what have we learned from the economic crisis? Sadly, I'm going to conclude that we haven't learned very much because beliefs are the hardest things for people to give up. Well, 
Let me just start off with a, I feel a bit embarrassed about this slide. I've got 100 years, 150 years of the history of economic thought in one slide. So forgive me if it's not in enough detail. What I want to suggest is that if you go back to the end of the 18th century or the 19th century, when we had the classical economists, guys like Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill, and they focused on the big social problems. They wanted to know what were the origins of growth? Why did we have cycles? What was the implications of, of income distribution? And then they treated those three things as all part of a great big package. They were all interlinked. And they also knew those classical economists of 150 years ago or 100 years ago that somewhere lurking in the background was the idea of the banking system and money that was created by the banking system and there was a lot of room for mischief. So that was sort of the end of the, the 18, 18, excuse me, the 1900s. And then I won't go, in, I won't, won't go into all, all the details of how all this happened, but modern macroeconomics basically started about uh, 100 years ago. And there, the approach turned out to be completely different. And when you look at what's being taught in the universities today, it is, again, completely different from what those classical economists were teaching. Now what's happening in modern economics is that growth is treated as exogenous. Cycles can't happen because the theory tells you that the economy, whenever it moves away from full employment, very quickly goes back to full employment. And these models have got no money in them at all. There's no money, there's no debt, there's no credit, there's no nothing. Right? That's modern, modern economics as it's, as it's currently being taught. And as I say, they're treated, those developments, growth, income distribution, and cycles, all as if they're completely different. And with respect to each one of them, there's no problem. Now, this crisis that started in 2007 indicates clearly the bankruptcy of this whole way of thinking. And I'll come back to this in just a few moments' time. Now, the last point that I have here is, could complexity be the way forward? And a very interesting development is there is now a whole, I would call it a science, of complex systems. And the contrast between complexity economics and modern economics, if you want to put it that way, couldn't be more stark. Because modern economics, as I've described it, basically treats the economy as a machine. You put something in, like monetary stimulus, and something comes out at the other end. Absolutely, perfectly forecastable. Whereas complexity economics, which basically says there's a million different agents all interacting, all learning from each other, all adapting and all growing, that comes to a very different conclusion. That way of looking at the world says there is no equilibrium. There is no equilibrium. And that everybody is constantly adapting and making progress. And I want to come back to this business about complexity later on because it's a very different way to look at the world and it, it holds an awful lot of promise for all of us. Now, I'm gonna speak really to five things quite, quite quickly. Um, risky prospects for the global economy, we're not out of this yet. And I think uh, Vladimir was making this point, we're not out of this yet, don't think that we are. Secondly, uh, I wanna talk about a first set of mistaken beliefs which really has to do with monetary policy and the question of the excessive use of monetary policy. I think that's one of the biggest things that's gone wrong. Then I wanna talk about the further contribution of some other false beliefs. Because the honest truth is that an awful lot of people have made an awful lot of mistakes and each of them have made their own contribution through their false beliefs to where we are today. Then I wanna talk about the interaction between the economic agents. And this is another sort of thought that comes out of the complexity. Complexity theory focuses not just on the different players in the game, but the different strategies and the different interrelationships between the various players in the game. So the lenders, the borrowers, the central bankers, the governments, the regulators, 
all interacting. And the way in which they interact is determined by the institutional relationships. So I guess what I'm going to conclude with is, if we're going to make progress, we're going to have to change those false beliefs. And secondly, we're going to have to change the character of the relationships between all the various players in the game. Well, risky prospects for the global economy. Um, what, can, what can one say? Um, We've had a very slow recovery. The AME stands for the Advanced Market Economies. Um, we had a very slow, slow recovery. Income inequality, which has been getting worse for years, has gotten worse still. Um, just in the course of the last couple of years, the EMEs, which is the Emerging Market Economies, uh, their situation has really started to worsen significantly as well. The so-called BRICS uh, have had a worse uh, last couple of years really even than the advanced market economies. Um, forecasts are more positive, but the honest truth is those forecasters, the IMF and the OECD, have made huge errors in the past. And one of the things, the insights that comes out of complexity economics is that in fact forecasting is impossible. So you pick up your newspaper and you look at the forecast, keep this in mind, that one of the principal tenets of complexity, of trying to forecast the future behavior of a very complex system, is it is impossible. Every geographical region has evident vulnerabilities. So we're all talking about, oh, there's this kind of recovery and things are looking better. If you want to look at it in terms of the bottle is half empty, as opposed to the bottle is half full, I see problems everywhere. The United States is still largely dysfunctional. The labor market is behaving in a fashion that nobody understands. Asset prices, I think, are completely overpriced and has happened on Friday. Perhaps we're on the verge of getting, getting a big change there. When you look at Europe, I won't tell Europeans about the difficulties in the Eurozone. You know it better than I do. China is in the process of a huge transformation from investment-led to consumer-led development. You don't get massive transformations without huge problems, so that worries me as well. Japan, Abenomics, I don't understand Abenomics, and what I do understand, I don't like, and the emerging markets I've already spoken of. And the, the problem, setbacks anywhere with repercussions everywhere, if you do think about the global economy as this highly internet, interlinked system, okay, of trading, of finance, and of everything else, the central point that I would make is that if anything goes wrong anywhere, there will be big repercussions everywhere, because that's the way these complex systems work. And when you think about macro policies, okay, whereas in 2007 we threw everything we had at it in terms of easy money and easy fiscal, we can't do either of those things anymore. We're basically at the, at the limits of the usefulness of macroeconomic policy. Well, I had one slide that gave you 150 years of, econ of the history of economic thought. I now have one slide to deal with monetary policy over the last 50 years. So listen, listen carefully. Um, in the immediate post-war period, um, I think we had the introduction of a policy of what Joan Robinson called bastard Keynesianism. It was the idea that you could use fine tuning of monetary and fiscal policy to lead to full employment. That was the basic idea through from the end of the war until the latter part of the 1960s, the early 1970s. And all that it led to was the great inflation. So that was a false belief and people recognized that it was a false belief and Paul Volcker then stepped in in 1981-82 to put an end to the disinflation. But he was immediately followed by Alan Greenspan. And some of you may remember in 1987, there was this massive stock market decline, and the United States led and everybody else followed with a massive easing of monetary policy in order to try to buoy everything up. And the fact of the matter is that if you go back and you look at this so-called Greenspan put, um, it worked in the sense that it led to, to faster demand, but
but it led to lower productivity growth, rising income inequality, and a whole series of what we'd call imbalances in the American economy, and for that matter, in the global economy, not least of which was a buildup of debt burdens that in the end, and Vladimir's referred to it already, that in the end would prove insupportable. And then what did we get in the run-up to the 2007 crisis? I would say effectively it was more of the same. So that when we had the recession in 1991, the answer was to lower interest rates. Uh, when we had problems in Asia in 1997, the answer was put interest rates on hold. In 1998, there were problems in the American financial system. They lowered interest rates. 2001, they did the same thing. And, and that led up to the crisis of 2007. It was just constantly more of the same. And I think since 2007, um, what we've had effectively has been still more of the same. So if you want to judge people on the basis of what they've done, then clearly the beliefs haven't changed because the policy hasn't changed. Monetary policy was not alone in having false beliefs. And let me just sort of run through some of the, some of the principal characters and, and how I think at least they got it wrong. Uh, and the, this is an attempt to answer some of the questions of the Vladimir raised. What about the borrowers? Why, why, did, why, why did they do what they did? Why did they take out all these debts that in the end they, 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 they couldn't service? I think one of the reasons was that they, they falsely believed that there was no difference between debt and earnings. So you had a situation in many of the advanced market economies, and we needn't go into the details of this, where the middle classes and the lower middle classes were getting squeezed by technological development, whatever, and it was hard to bring in the earned income. And the people themselves, aided by the politicians and the central banks, and I'll come back to this, basically said, if you can't earn the money and spend it, it's just as good to borrow the money and spend it. But of course, that's not true, because if you borrow the money, you have to pay it back. And the second thing, of course, about the borrowers is that they bought into this idea that if you lived in a house and the price of your house went up, you were wealthier. And that the nation as a whole was wealthier because house prices went up. Now, at the level of common sense, there's something really crazy here. The idea that we can all collectively get richer because our house prices go up, all that it really comes down to is somebody who sells a house at an inflated price sells it to somebody who buys it at an inflated price, but no wealth is created. But these were false beliefs on the part of the borrowers. I think the lenders had a lot of false beliefs too. Um, there's a guy called High Minsky uh, who came up with these sorts of theories in the 1980s and the 1990s. And High Minsky basically said, stability breeds instability which in complex adaptive systems is actually one of the characteristics. Stability breeds instability. So what happened was we had that period of time, let's say from the middle 1980s through until 2007, characterized by the Americans as the great moderation, where from the banker's perspective, life was pretty good. And they took that stability and basically said, the world has become a safer place. Okay? So I can now take more risks because in a certain sense there's less risks to take. Follow me? So that they started to do some stuff that was really pretty adventurous, but they thought it was okay because the world was inherently a less risky place. And that was a false belief because it wasn't a less risky place. This little comment about near-term profits is all goes beyond the issue of beliefs. It goes to the, it goes to the, the heart of it all, which is which is values and which is ethics. And the problem over the course of the last 20 years is that the ethical system in the banking, in the banking business changed. And when you read in the paper about all of this litigation and these billions and billions of dollars of fines, it's because the bankers did some really bad things during that period of time. And they weren't alone, the supervisors. Uh, I worked closely with these people for 20, 30 years, the supervisors, bank supervisors, in Basel and elsewhere. And their whole way of dealing with it, of, 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 of stability in the financial system, 
was bottom up. Where they basically said, if the individual institutions are healthy, the whole system is healthy. And the problem, from the perspective of complexity, is this is not true. It's a false belief. That you can have relationships between banks, between the financial sector and the real sector, that can have extremely poisonous, toxic implications for everybody, even if the individual institutions start off by being very, very healthy. So another set of false beliefs. I'll come back to the central bankers and their false beliefs. I had the slide earlier on, which if you reflect upon it, was really nothing more than a description of what everybody did, okay? The Greenspan put and all that sort of stuff. But the question is, why did the central bankers feel that they could do that? Constant infusion of monetary, monetary and credit expansion. Why did they feel they could do that? I think the basic reason is because they had convinced themselves, and I tell you there's no good historical or empirical reason for believing this, they had convinced themselves that if they could deliver price stability, then all the other aspects of stability in the economy would be guaranteed. That price stability was a guarantee of macroeconomic stability. And as it turned out, that was a false belief. That was a false belief. And we should have known it was a false belief because there was no inflation prior to the Great, Great Depression. There was no inflation in Japan prior to the Japanese Great Recession. There was no inflation in Southeast Asia before the Southeast Asian crisis. But that's what they believed. And the other thing that they believed, even for those few people who said maybe things could go wrong, was that if anything does go wrong, we can clean up afterwards. Better to clean than lean. So that you could keep on printing the money up to the time of the crisis, and if something went wrong, you could use still more money to easily clean the whole thing up afterwards. And as we now know, that too was wrong. The academics, um, I think that just brings me back to my first slide. Um, the academics actually believed that crises were impossible. If you look at all the models, the so-called dynamic, stochastic, general equilibrium models, and even many of the other structural models used in places like the IMF and the OECD, crises are effectively impossible. So there's no need to forecast them. There's no need to try to prevent them. There's no need to try to put, put things in place so you can clean up more easily afterwards. They're impossible. And I should just note um, another thing about these models and I said earlier on, money and debt are not in those models, okay? They're, they're not part of the story at all, the academic story. The other thing to focus on is power. Money, debt, and power were irrelevant. So that income distribution, according to all of their theories, basically depended on the marginal productivity of the individual contributor to the, econo to the economy. So if you are rich, the justification was because you were producing a lot for the, for, the, for the economy. And if you were poor, well, it was your own fault because you were producing very little uh, for the economy. So it was all very sort of neat and airtight and very satisfactory for the powerful and the people that were rich. Um, politicians bought into this too. And I see this at the OECD all the time. All of those periods when uh, the economy was growing rapidly and all the tax money was flowing in, what did the politicians do? And the answer was they spent most of it. Because what they wanted to believe was that all of this money coming in was coming in on a permanent basis. And it wasn't true. It was a false belief. And we found out when the economy turned down, and that's why the deficits of so many different countries so rapidly went into huge overruns. Um, because this thing, in fact, the boom was temporary and not permanent. And they too, the politicians, uh, wanted to believe it so that they could spend the money, but they also believed that in the face of rising income inequality, that they, which is a tough thing to deal with, they also wanted to believe they didn't have to do anything because the boom was permanent and the money would trickle down. Another false belief. Um, and it's not just the agents. As I say, if you look at it from the perspective of complex, adaptive system with all of these different agents interacting, um, the interactions are as important as the nature of the agents themselves. And with six classes of agents, you've got an awful lot of interactions 
bilateral, trilateral, quadrilateral. And another interesting thing about the complexity theory is that one of the principles is that there's absolutely no relationship between the size of the trigger and the size of the resulting crisis. So for example, you can throw a snowball in the Alps and most of the time nothing happens and less frequently something happens and once in a while something really, really big happens, an, av an avalanche. And I guess what I'm trying to suggest here is that we've got all of these interactions and some of them at least, I think, could pose serious dangers. And I want to say just a couple of words about it. And the suggestion here, because it's the institutional arrangements, okay, that determine the interactions, we need to think not just about changing false beliefs, we need to think about changing all the institutional relationships as well. So, what are the sorts of things I'm talking about? And this is my second to last, second to last slide. Um, I think when we look at these interactions between these various groups, um, we see cause for belief that those interactions have either contributed to the current crisis or seem likely to contribute to the crisis going forward. Now, what do I mean by this? The relationship between the bankers and the supervisors. Uh, I think you can make a pretty good case uh, for something close to regulatory capture that the regulators, far from going in and sort of, how can I say, taking the big stick to the bankers of more or less being in bed with the bankers up until quite recently. And people who said our risk control systems are well developed and completely under control and our compliance systems are working properly, the supervisors bought into it. And they shouldn't have been so naive, but they did. Um, I think on the capital front, there's huge um, room for discussion uh, and lots and lots of academic stuff coming out now about whether the capital requirements are in fact anywhere near as tough as they should be. Regulatory capture, I don't know. What about the bankers and the politicians? I find this really disturbing and again, there's a lot of books being written on this. Uh, bankers and the politicians are far too close. I'm sorry if I'm going to offend anybody who's political in the room. Um, some countries perhaps much more than in others, and I am thinking about the United States in particular. Uh, the lobbying that goes on, millions if not billions of dollars in lobbying. Um, financial contributions in many countries, but again particularly the United States, people need a lot of money in order to get reelected, and the bankers have got a lot of money. And I think this is, this, this is a threat not just to the market system, but it's, it's actually a threat to democracy itself. Um, too big to fail. Uh, somehow, we recognize this problem of too big to fail seven years ago, 10 years ago, maybe longer. But we're seven years into the crisis, and the too big to fail thing is still there. It is by no means being resolved, seven years into it. The aversion to debt resolution. Um, from time immemorial, when debts have been too big, they have been written off because they have to be. Because if the debtor can't pay, the creditor doesn't get paid. And it's better to get paid 50 cents on the dollar or 50 rappen on the Swiss rank than it is to receive nothing at all. It's always been done that way. But the resistance to debt resolution at a time when debt is 30% higher today than it was when the crisis hit us, 30% okay? higher in the G20, the aversion to saying, to debt resolution and saying, I have to write it off is incredible. What about the central banks and the supervisors, the relationship between them? Um, I think before the crisis, the honest truth was nobody was looking at systemic problems, you know, that are characteristic of a complex adaptive system. Nobody was doing it. The supervisors were doing it bottom up and the central banks were talking about oversight, but in fact did nothing to reflect the buildup of systemic problems. So fell between the cracks. And since that time, I think we've had a continuing problem between the central banks and the regulators, which I frankly don't really understand, other than to say they live in separate silos. The central bankers have got their foot firmly on the accelerator of the economic machine. 
and the supervisors have got their foot firmly on the brake. And there's something in there that doesn't, really doesn't add up. Academic central banks and politicians, I, I think I've already mentioned that, but I guess it's the question of the incentive. Why have these false beliefs been reinforced? And I think you can make a powerful argument that it's because the powerful want that to happen, as I said before. Central banks and politicians, what about the relationship between those two? Well, prior to the crisis, you heard all of this talk about central bank independence okay? and the pursuit of price stability. Forget it. It's over. Why do I say that? Central banks have been involved in issues that are fundamentally distributional. Okay? The various things that they've done, which financial lives, which financial institution lives, which one dies, whose paper to accept, who's not to accept, fundamentally distributional issues. Keeping interest rates very, very low, which basically hurts the savers to the benefits of the debtors. A massive redistribution of income via monetary policy. Governments that are over debted, they want those interest rates to stay low as a form of financial repression to gradually work away the value of the debt over time. So the independence of central banks, I think that's, that's an expression for a, for a past era. And lastly, and this we get down to the most fundamental thing of all, the relationship between the politicians and the voters. The average guy in the street wants an easy out and he wants a fast payout. He wants a fast payoff. I'm taking Coles to Newcastle here with the minister here. Um, that's what they want. And if the politicians don't give it to them, they don't get reelected. So the people get the government that they deserve. And if all you're going to focus on is short-term gain, you better be prepared for long-term pain. So these, fundam these problems are fundam absolutely fundamental, it seems to me. Well, my last slide. Are we going to get a big change, a big paradigm shift, or are we going to get more of the same? The surprising onset of this crisis and the fact that it has gone on as long as it has and is not over yet, one would have thought that this would have prompted an absolutely fundamental rethink about both the belief system and about the character of the interrelationships between the, the agents. Uh, the honest truth is this has not happened. And if you go back and you look at virtually every one of those groups that I ran through, they more or less are doing, are believing what they did before the crisis began. Um, I guess I am particularly concerned about the absence of change at the level of beliefs, but I'm also very concerned about the absence of appetite for fundamental institutional change. There's no appetite for going back and revisiting fundamental things like narrow banking, uh, breaking up banks that are too big to fail. There is no appetite for a rethink of the international monetary system, whereas many people feel that that none system is fundamentally broken. So things have not changed. Now what explains that outcome? Why have things not changed? Well, Thomas Kuhn wrote a book uh, 50 years ago now, I think, called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, in which he gave all sorts of reasons why in all sorts of areas, paradigm shift is, is very, very hard. And not least, it's because if people have spent their entire adult lives espousing a belief, they're not going to give it up very, very easily. Second thing is that um, Daniel Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize in economics in 2002, I think, points this out. When people are really startled by something that was completely unexpected and they don't understand, as I said, you would have expected them to fundamentally rethink. Daniel Kahneman says, no, that's the very last thing that they do. In panic, they retreat back into the old belief system. And that's why, in my judgment, why you have in Europe the Germans with this fundamental focus on it's the deficit, it's government debt, it's, it's, it's the prospects of future hyperinflation. And why in the United States it's the complete opposite. 
their historical defining moment was the Great Depression. And for them, their, their belief system is, if we're not very careful, we're going to get the Great Depression and deflation all over again. And that's what's happened. People have retreated into their old belief systems as opposed to re-questioning. And the last thing is that because so many different agents had false beliefs, it's very tempting for each one of them to say, hey, it wasn't my false belief that got us into trouble. It was his false belief. And so what you're seeing in a big way right at the moment, central banks, for example, absolutely refusing to take any responsibility for what's happened here, basically because they say it's all regulatory failure. Now, there's something fundamentally wrong here. But the bottom line is, everybody's got an excuse for saying, I was all right. I can stay doing what I was doing before. So we've got some problems here that take us right back to human nature. That's why I think independent think tanks, um, in a sense, meetings like this are enormously important. Because the people that are inside the system are not going to change it. It's only going to get changed by pressure from people who are outside the system and will not be admitting error, as it were, by saying that something has gone seriously wrong. And my last thing here, um, there are a lot of people doing stuff that's novel outside governments. Uh, there's this new outfit called the Institute for New Economic Thinking, uh, which is sponsored by George Soros. Uh, there is a big initiative at the OECD called NIAC, the New Approaches to Economic Challenges. And this last one that I'm just making reference to is the, the Institute for Economic uh, Analysis in the UK. And they've got a new series called New Thinking in Political Economy. And one of the books that I've just finished reading is one that is called uh, The Rediscovery of Classical Economics. So I finish, in a sense, back to my first slide, which is that um, classical economics was, in a certain sense, the principal tenets maintained through the Austrians. And you can see a clear line between the classical economists, concerns for growth, income distribution, through Hayek and the Austrians, and now onto this new theory of complexity. And I've been in this business now for about 40 years. I'm sad to say I have to look back on most of it and say, certainly made an awful lot of big mistakes. But what you can say when you look at some of this new literature is that the future really looks, in that sense, intellectually very promising. C'est un tour de force, Bill. Full of intellectual impetuses. Uh, well, first of all, it's a pity that nobody from the uh, board of Centre Bank can't be here today. Indeed, they have a, for a couple of months back, planned an offside with the top management of the bank, so they apologize. Neither the governor, neither people from the bank board can't be here, because I'm sure, Bill, that people from our Centre Bank board will be, would be ready to participate in the discussion. Second, as somebody who currently teaches at Charles University a course of macroeconomic policies and uh, theories starting from 1870 and finishing by today. I'm extremely pleased to see that you went back to the classical economics and this is where you see some kind of a, of a starting point. Third, as somebody who has been engaged in cooperation with a large international investment bank, I'm also very glad to hear that we have seen here a kind of a complexity approach in singling out who are those who not only take their responsibility, but who participated in the system and policies which led to the crisis. And allow me again, uh, it's more or less a, a, a coincidence that I'm quoting Raghuram Rajan again from his fault lines. Because when he spoke about who is responsible there, is a, there are two sentences which allow me to quote, because it's not only the financial and banking sector, but I quote, a much wider cast of characters share responsibility for the crisis. It includes domestic politicians, foreign governments, economists like me and you, and people like you, we all. Furthermore, furthermore what enveloped all of us was not 
some sort of collective hysteria and mania. Somewhat frighteningly, each one, of, or each one of us did what was sensible given the incentives we faced. And that's probably what are the incentives which are going to change. And again, not only for the financial sector bankers, but also for the politicians, even for people like me and you. But thank you very much, Bill, for your very excellent presentation. Now let's move to our another speaker, and I'm very glad that I can welcome here Mr. Jan Vincent Rostovsky, or as we call him, Jacek Rostovsky, who is a Polish and British economist. Jacek was born into the Polish into a Polish exile family in London, where his father served as personal secretary to the Prime Minister of Polish government in exile. And the family did not return to to Poland after the war, but what I read, I think that you were raised and spent a big part of your uh, childhood in a British foreign and commonwealth, commonwealth offices where your father has been posted and you lived mainly in Kenya, Mauritius and Seychelles. That looks like a resort where the modern bankers tend to disappear in the times of crisis. But if I'm not mistaken, you spent there sometimes in 1950s and 1960s. For a couple of people in this room, name Jacek Rostovsky when we were working in the Academy of Sciences in old Czechoslovakia, 1970s and 1960s. This was an authority. This was an authority in the literature. If I'm not mistaken, you were one of the founders or editors of Communist Economies. Uh, you studied at the University College in London, and you have your uh, Master of Science in London School of Economics and Political Science. And again, if I'm not mistaken, our other speaker, Magda Desai, was your teacher. Uh, a part of being an uh, academician known to people who at least have an opportunity or courage to follow the non-Marxist economic literature, uh, you immediately at the end of communism you went back to Poland, you started to work both in Poland as an advisor to um, Leszek Balcerowicz, you also advised shortly Russian Federation. Later you held a couple of different posts, uh, uh, namely as a chairman of Macroeconomic Policy Council at Polish Minister of Finance. You are a co-founder of CASE, Center for Social and Economic Research, one of the most famous Polish economic and political, uh, political think tanks. You serve as the economic advisor to National Bank of Poland, et cetera, et cetera. And in 2007, uh, Jacek Rostowski joined the cabinet of Premier Donald Tusk and served as the finance minister of Poland till December 2013. In November 2012, Jacek was uh, cited by the Financial Times as the third best finance minister in Europe. And in, obviously, your latest position, you are quite well known to the Czech in the Czech Republic as well. Jacek, once again, thank you very much for coming. And now the floor is yours. <laughs> Vladimir, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to try to speak uh, maybe a little bit more briefly than, uh, than Bill White. Um, first of all, that's going to be easier because although we hardly spoke at all before the conference, um, I have to say that I agree with about 80% of what he said. And what's more, um, I think I've been thinking along the, the same lines for many, many years. Um, so that should allow us, allow me to save a little bit of time because I won't need to say a large part of what he has said so much better than I ever could have. Um, I agree with him that uh, we haven't learned a great deal and what I'm going to talk about is what I think we've learned from the crisis, less about what we've learned about what caused the crisis, more about what we've learned during the crisis, because that's the period when um, I, was, uh, I was finance minister and then deputy prime minister in Poland. Um, one of the 
things that I agree with uh, very strongly in what Bill White said was, is the importance of institutions and the importance also of economic structures. Now, both Bill White and I, and I think Meghnad Desai, we were all brought up in an intellectual world where these things supposedly had no importance at all. I had the fortune of uh, being an economist who specialized in um, the economics of the Soviet Union and the other communist countries. And it was hard in those circumstances to believe that institutions, institutional setups, uh, and structures had no importance at all. And therefore, people like, um, like Vladimir, like myself, approached the tradition of Western economics and Karel Diba in a very different way. We never had any doubts but that institutions were important. And of course, that came home to roost in a very strong way in the early 1990s when we had to create those institutions so that they would function in our own countries. Um, I think that I'll come back to these, to these issues uh, as, as the talk progresses. Um, I'll just note uh, one particular or two particular differences between me and my views and those of, of Bill White. First of all, I'm not as optimistic as he is about the usefulness of complexity. I think it's a useful general approach. Uh, it tells you how hard it is to come to any definitive conclusions. I'm not sure it helps you to come to any definitive conclusions. And I think that one of the unfortunate, I mean, I think, and in a way we can see that in Bill's talk, which was very strong on criticism of what, of the mistakes that had been made, but maybe not quite as um, self-confident in terms of the proposals of what should be done. So in terms that I think most of us will understand, it was strong on Kto Vinavat, but it wasn't very strong on Stodielet. Uh, and yet you need to do both. You need to, address, you need to address both subjects. And the second point where I think I disagree is I'm not sure that we've actually, we're necessarily actually seeing excessive use of monetary policy at the moment, and I'll come back to that later on. So I'm going to speak more modestly. I'm going to speak about what I've learned. Um, some of these are things that I be believed before, and they've been confirmed and some of them are, are new, maybe fewer of them are new than should be, and it sort of suggests that the end point of Bill's talk where we all go back to what we believed before is actually confirmed in my case, and the fact it happens to that what I believed before happens to agree with what Bill believed before, and what he believes now is maybe slightly worrying, but there we are. So the first thing that I think I learned is that, and I think and this is fairly generally accepted, and that is that, the fi that financial sector crises are key to really important macroeconomic fluctuations. And as Bill said, the financial sector was practically not unpresent uh, in the models that were, create that were used in the past. Um, and unfortunately, that continues to be the case to a large extent. The effects of financial crises are much larger than those of ordinary policy errors or of ordinary cyclical fluctuations. Um, and that in itself suggests that Bill is right in the fundamental approach of saying, well, complexity has something to say to us here because what this says is that you have sudden discontinuities. Everything seems to be going well and then suddenly an awful lot goes wrong, because that's what happens in the financial crisis. Right? So if we're looking back to earlier uh, intellectual history, it's interesting that this particular point is one that was not picked up on very strongly at all, for instance, by John Maynard Keynes. 
He thought that these were natural fluctuations, that macroeconomic fluctuations were the result of natural fluctuations in animal spirits, in optimism. Instead, I believe, and I think Bill does, they're the result of an important part of our institutional setup just breaking, mostly financial systems entering crisis. Now, um, the conclusion that uh, I draw from this is that there are times when macroeconomic disruption, usually resulting from a financial crisis, is so far reaching, is so large, that we need to shift from business as usual, which I think is mainly, I'm talking now from the point of view of government policy. Under normal circumstances, in business as usual, the main responsibility of government, various state institutions, is to provide a stable operating environment for business. But from time to time, we have these shocks, these big crises. And then we need to shift from providing a stable operating environment for business to massive macroeconomic policy intervention to prevent um, very significant depressions, long-term slowdowns. Um, now, this doesn't happen very often. Um, at a world level, um, it actually happened the last time 80 years ago. Um, that was the last great crisis we had. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not an important issue. It is when it happens once every 80 years, or roughly. And on this, both John Maynard Keynes and, and Milton Friedman uh, were right. They both understood this in, in a fundamental way. They certainly, Milton Friedman, understood that if you have one of these situations, um, you have to respond very strongly. And in spite of what a lot of people who call themselves monetarists say, um, today, um, Milton Friedman was saying that the big problem in the 1980s was that, sorry, in the 1930s, <laughs> was that um, monetary po policy uh, was not uh, active enough. That the Federal Reserve thought it was undertaking expansionary monetary policy because base money was expanding, but because the larger measures of money were contracting, it wasn't doing nearly enough of that. Um, so we do face these great crises very rarely, but they are a key issue for policymakers. The second thing I, I, I think I've learned is that transmission mechanisms for monetary policy in particular, but not only for all economic policy, but, but let's stay with the example of monetary policy. Transmission mechanisms keep changing in an economy. They're not hardwired. It's not like having a pipe that goes along and carries water or a canal or, or electric wires. It's much more, they behave much more like the shifting channels in, a, in the sandy delta of a river. They keep changing their position, their depth, um, and how much water they carry, and even sometimes the direction in which they're going. And I think the monetarists, um, monetarist academic economists, were wrong in not seeing that. There are times and this is the next point I'd make, when the only effective monetary policy channel is the fiscal channel. The only way of actually getting money into the economy because the other monetary policy channels have broken down is actually running a budget deficit. It doesn't happen often, but it happens from time to time. And that is something that is, in a sense, at the heart of Keynes's response to the uh, Great Depression of the 1930s, and he was right in that then, and I think that's an approach which we need to apply in certain situations today. And here I think I probably disagree very strongly with, with Bill. 
So I would say that the central dilemma of economic policy today is how to ensure that standard, that a safe operate, uh, operating environment for business is in place in normal times, a stable, not stable operating environment for business in, is in place in normal times, while retaining an override mechanism that allows for massive policy intervention on the rare occasions when that's needed. And this is very hard, I think, for two reasons. First of all, ensuring a stable operating environment for business is in some way related, and in, in important ways, related to ensuring stable property rights. Um, in a way, discretionary pol economic policy infringes expectations about the future and in some ways infringes, um, by definition, rights. And this is the point that uh, Bill put in a slightly different way by saying that economic policy, monetary policy, for example, has distributional effects. So normally we would want to avoid that. Right? We don't want governments coming along and taking from one, lot, one group of people and giving to another unless it's sanctioned by parliament. And even that we would rather tend to avoid, prefer to avoid. Certainly businesses are better off if there's a stable environment and they can uh, count on that environment being maintained and they can count on not having uh, income uh, transferred from them to someone else or even from someone else, someone else to them. Um, but sometimes we have to step away from that. Sometimes we have to step away from that and partly that goes back to another important thing that I think was said earlier. That is if you actually achieve stability for a very long time, this is something I really agree with very strongly in what, with, in what the previous speaker said, then you create a feeling of such confidence, such carelessness, that you actually build up the conditions for the kind of massive crisis that we had, and then, of course, you need to respond, and you need to be able to respond. Um, the second reason um, is that the shifting sands of the transmission mechanisms that I spoke about and the regulatory and economic structures of any um, polity um, change so often that in fact it's often hard to know what you should do. Right? In other words, it's all very nice to say, well, you know, we should be willing to override the, um, the, st the independent institutions that guarantee st the stable operating environment for business. But given that the way in which we can influence the macroeconomy changes, it's subject to these shifting sands. And given that the shifting sands, the channels that go through the shifting sands, change particularly dramatically in a crisis, it actually becomes very hard to know what are the right, what are the right over, override policies that we should apply. Um, So that's, in a sense, the dilemma that I think we have learned that we face. Now, of course, um, again, referring back to the earlier talk, all I've really laid out, all that we've really learned is that there are more unknowns that we know about. The pre and it's exactly what was said earlier, that the previous confidence about our knowledge has gone. But I think there are certain conclusions that we can draw from this um, new knowledge of unknowns. Um, in fact, there are three, three conclusions that I draw from the whole period. The first is that, and this is where I, I disagree with, with, with Bill, 
The fact that the highly interventionist Greenspan put created the conditions that led to the crisis doesn't in itself mean that similar policies are not needed to get us out of the current crisis. All right? Now, Vladimir said earlier that very few people forecast the crisis. Um, and then he said that Bill had been warning about the crisis coming for many, for many years. Um, Andrzej Bratkowski and I wrote a paper for Case in uh, war forecasting the crisis. Uh, unfortunately, we wrote it in 1998, which was 10 years too early, and not of much use to anyone. Now, I'm actually not ashamed of that, because I think that shows exactly what the problem is. Right? In other words, had the Greenspan policy put not been pursued, we would have had more often, we would have had crises more often, but they would have been smaller. But of course, it was extremely difficult to foretell at all when the big crisis that, was resu that resulted from pushing the small crises away, pushing them, kicking them down the, down the road, was going to come. But the fact that that policy was wrong at the time the Greenspan policy, doesn't mean that, an, that expansionary monetary policy, aggressively expansionary monetary policy, is necessarily wrong at the moment now that we've got ourselves into this hole. That's the first conclusion that I would uh, draw. And coming back to the point about complexity, I'm not sure it's related to complexity, but environmentalists say that one of the reasons we often have these very large forest fires in Australia and the United States is that there are too many firefighters going around preventing the small forest fires. And I think that's an analogy for what we've faced in the world economy, but unfortunately it's not much more than an analogy. The second conclusion I would draw is that the more we hive off key government functions to so-called independent regulatory institutions, the more we probably ensure a stable operating environment for businesses, and that's a good thing. But the harder it becomes to respond to unexpected crises. This is one of the striking lessons from the crisis that I've drawn. The extraordinary mm, egotism of independent regulatory institutions. They only really think about their own little bit of the problem. Uh, they're extremely unwilling to think about the impact of that, of what they do to achieve their goals on the wider economic and social scene. Now, mm, this is perfectly understandable if uh, one thinks about how bureaucratic institutions work. But it's actually very dangerous in a situation in which, as I said earlier, we have these shifting sands of transmission mechanism. Suddenly, the policies that made sense in good times need to be, may need to be changed. And we don't, can't know in advance how they might need to be changed. It's only ex post that we can see, well, once it's all happened, what we might need to do. And even then, we might be wrong. And yet we create institutions that are given a huge amount of independence, sometimes constitutional independence. Um, I think that's the problem that we have at the moment with many of the independent regulators and with many of the independent central banks. Mm. Okay, and the final thing I might, I think I would like to say is that what, can we, what conclusion can we draw for, from economics, from, for economics from that as a discipline? If you're dealing with a landscape that is changing very fast, then what you should presumably do 
is put a lot more effort into describing and understanding that landscape, institutional landscape, the regulatory landscape, the structural landscape, in terms of the structure of the financial system or of the real economy. It's as if, so what we should really be concentrating in, on is the way the landscape changes as time goes on, as we move through that landscape rather than trying to identify spurious laws of motion of the economy, which is what an awful lot of economics has concentrated on for, for the 200 years that economics has existed. Economists are a bit like a driver who tries to understand exactly how his car works, but almost but knows almost nothing about the landscape he's driving through at the time. Has no idea whether the road is, he's driving blind and doesn't know whether the road will turn left or right. He's spending all his time worrying about uh, just how brakes work and how the internal combustion engine works and so on and so forth. That is really not good enough. We really need to have a much stronger descriptive element. It doesn't mean we can give up analysis altogether because we won't understand the descriptive aspects of our discipline if we don't have any analysis, but the share of effort going into understanding what actually is um, in terms of structures, institutions and so on needs to be much greater. And the final thing I would say is that because of all this, um, I'm much more pessimistic about the intellectual future of economics than, uh, than the previous speaker was. Um, but I hope that if we remain modest in our expectations about our ability, our intellectual abilities in economics, maybe we can be a little bit more optimistic uh, in terms of, um, in terms of, uh, of the of the future for policy making. And one final word. If what I say is true, then these differences are not only differences, very important differences for the world economy over time, there will also be very important differences in transmission mechanisms, in structures, in institutions, in the whole way that the economy and economic policy work, as between countries. So on that confusing note, I hope I've intentionally made things less easy to understand. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jacek. Some three or four years ago, you have published an article in Financial Times Basically, what you have said was that after 2000, or maybe even before, and you mentioned that strategy, a deep Keynesian project, in an effort to smooth the cycle, we came to the situation where we really we were able to smooth the cycle via the so-called great moderation. But we didn't know that we were pushing the problems ahead of us. And the experience teached us that in trying to smooth the cycle for too long, we only opened the space for the huge depression and recession to come. I remember that I tried to emulate your article in an, another article in the Czech press. Probably partially I was not probably so able to write it in such a nice a concise way as he did for the FT. But I remember I have called for a storm of protest, mainly from the left-leaning uh, Czech journalist, that I'm, a, as a matter of a defending the presence of the crisis, recessions, great depressions. And after all, I'm Goldman Sachs, so what the hell I'm talking about. And uh, listening to you, I very much remembered that article of yours in FT because it, need, it was a very interesting one. I would also, I wouldn't, I wouldn't very much agree with all of you what you have said, but I would probably uh, support 
your little bit distinction from Bill in terms of complexity, even from the practical point of view, the complexity asks for the long-term process understanding, think tanks cooking up their new views, then translating them into better and better understanding policies, etc. While at the same time, electorates, public, will be more and more uh, impatient and asking politicians for the quick solutions. And the big question is whether the developed world has time enough to bridge this period before the new thinking makes some kind of a quantum leap in our understanding, not only in terms of the analysis, but also in terms of the policies needed. All right, let me move now to our last pick of to today, Lord Magna Desai, or as I see, in his CV, a Baron Desai. Magnat, again, we are extremely pleased to have you here. And let me start in showing you a book which you might probably recognize. It's a time-worn applied econometrics book, which Magnat Desai published in 1976. I have bought it during my studies in Belgium in 1978. The price by Philip Allen Publishers in London was five pounds and 75 pences. I bought it in Belgium for 437 Belgian francs. Today, such a book would cost about 25%. So if the price of the academic textbooks or academic books should be a proxy for inflation, uh, the British inflation over past 30 years was something about 400%. So it is. But I must say that this book, which indeed, as you see, is time-worn, helped me and my colleague Karel Diba, who is eagerly sitting in the first row, uh, more in our econometric modeling of centrally planned economists, more than a couple of that time fashionable textbooks, because this really deals with the real stuff. So let me thank you for that some 35 years after. Uh, Lord Desai was born in India. He studied at the University of Mumbai and he got his PhD in the University of Pennsylvania, USA. He started to work as a specialist at the Department of Agricultural Economists in the University of uh, California. But in, in 1965, he moved to London School of Economics and to some extent he's linked in, uh, with LSE uh, till uh, today. His first book is on Marx and Eco Marxian economics theory. Then he followed his book with applied econometrics and then a couple of other or many books and about 200 articles in academic journals and, and elsewhere. But Lord Desai is a complex personality. He writes about the Indian cinema. He wrote a very interesting book about the uh, Dilip Kumar, the Indian film actor under the titled Nehru's hero, Dilip Kumar, in the life of India. Uh, he also, if I'm not mistaken, back in 1992, established the Center for Study of Global Government, where he used to serve as a, as a, as a chairman, and he retired in 2003. He is Professor Emeritus today in the London School of Economics. I must tell you one gossip. I asked Magnat what he's going to speak about, and we agreed last night that he will speak as the third speaker. And he said, I don't know. I'm going to look at the audience while the previous two speakers speak, and then I'm going to decide what the audience is up to, and then I'm going to speak about it. So, Megana, the floor is yours, and we are anxious to see how did you read the audience. Please. Lord Megana Desai. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, it's, uh, you know, when you have, as one of your students, a finance minister, you know you have been a complete failure. Uh, I, why didn't I become a finance minister? Why did he? Anyway, it's a great pleasure to be with Jacek and uh, Bill White, and to be in Prague, where I first visited in 1966. So I know this city very much and love it. Let me start with a completely uh, orthogonal thought to all that has been said before. And Bill talked about uh, holding on to false beliefs. 
And I think one aspect which nobody has discussed as to why this confidence in markets that work and so on was so deep is basically here. is the collapse of socialism as a consistent set of beliefs without a shot being fired, which completely surprised the Western world and made them totally complacent. People have forgotten. I mean, I spent half of my academic life talking about Marxist economic theory, communist economic systems, things like that. It's no longer there. So the one big rival to capitalist economics, market economics, whatever you call it, is gone. And one of the major things which happened, and I want to come back to this uh, in a minute, is suddenly the long boom in uh, sort of capitalist economies, which maybe started in 1945, got longer. We had what's called globalization. And not only globalization reached out to emerging market economies, but a variety of Eastern European economies entered the capitalist fold. There are more stock markets, more bond markets, more in more banks uh, to open up, more money to play around with. And you know, no wonder the financial sector expanded way beyond anybody imagined. So I mean, we have to remember that some of the history is very recent. Okay. So let me just go back and say, if you imagine that the Great Depression starts at some time in 29 and finished sometimes in the late 30s or early 40s, when the crisis happened in 2007, the world had something close to 65 to 70 years without a really deep shock. And by, by any standards, even by, from when uh, data start on microeconomy, say about sort of 200 years ago, there has never been a 65 years of more or less uninterrupted prosperity. I'm, I'm going to specialize this a little bit in a minute. And so when economists were surprised they didn't feel like immediately going back to the drawing boards and changing their models and so on. They said, come on, it's worked well so far. It will start working again. And so one of the, one of the things I say in defense of uh, academic economics, because I'm the only sort of still surviving academic economist here, um, economics changes slowly, as, as Bill White said, you know, because economics doesn't really want to give up what it has and go out into uncharted territories just because they failed to uh, predict a crisis of 60, you know, the first crisis in 70 years. Now, that said, we have to take seriously what happened and what we learned from it. Uh, I, will, I will take it as given what other two, two have said. One thing which is true, that after the Great Depression, we had one innovation in economics after about 200 years. You know, we had the classical economics, and then we had Keynes, more or less, right? at least in terms of academic economics. And what Keynes told us is that, you know, there may not be one equilibrium, there may be more than one equilibrium, not just full employment, but less than full employment. And that kind of machine ran for a while. You know, he, we cranked that up, we, we put it into policy uh, analysis and things like that. And it, it, it ran as very good. And right about 1975, 30 years after the, after the Second World War, 30 years of continuous growth uh, and, and sort of prosperity, for the first time in the history of capitalism, that mass consumption started growing. People forget how recent mass prosperity is. In late 1950s, there were agonized articles in British sociology journals that the working classes were buying cars 
how shocking, how could a proletariat be buying cars, you know, this, this, you know, because people are still thinking in terms of crashes of capitalism, this, all this thing will collapse like a, like a pack of cards and things like that. You know, Marxists were still saying, this will not, this is, this is a delusion. And it went on happening. So to some extent, economics kept on surprising itself by the robustness of the Keynesian so, and it, it lasted 30 years, and 30 years is a very long time for a, for a boom to last almost, a, and it's called a golden quarter century or golden 30 years of Keynesian revolution. And then we had the inflationary uh, uh, pressures. And when the inflationary pressures came, suddenly everybody thought the fun thing to do is to get rid of inflation. If you could get rid of inflation, everything will come back normally. The Keynesians at Phillips curve, it didn't quite work. Then the monetarists came, and monetarists said, forget about all this, control money supply. You know. And you know, the developed world converged to the idea that nothing wrong with Keynes. If you fix inflation, you're all right. And once, you know, we had about eight, nine years of stagflation. But once inflation had been fixed, uh, you know, causing a deep recession and so on, Everything was fine. I've lived through a lot of controversies in macroeconomic Keynesians with the monetarists and all that, and all controversies stopped by about late 1980s, early 1990s. That's what the great moderation was for. You see, Keynesian economics is all right. All you need to do is to control inflation, let the central bank control inflation, and all will be well. There's nothing else to worry about. Just as Bill was saying that the Germans were worried about hyperinflation because that was a big, big shock. And the Americans worried about the Great Depression. He was saying, hey, no need to worry about this. We got, we got the key, we got, we got a simple, simple little key and you know, we got the diagrams, we, 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 got, we got the econometric models and so on. And the, the interesting thing was, it was a success which ruined economics not his failure. Uh, and success also meant that there came a certain amount of laziness in thinking. And I want to say that some of our problems, again, which have been uh, rehearsed by Bill White uh, and, and Jacek, uh, come from uh, this laziness. First is, we still in economics think in terms of single economies. We may talk about anything we like, but we still think in terms of single economies comparative static. We all talked about globalization, but we still don't have a globally integrated macro model. And this is where the underconsumption problem came. Yes, there was underconsumption in uh, Asian economies. They were saving oodles of their, their meager incomes. The financial sector had had a revolution and become efficient in transmitting that money to developed country uh, banks. That was also all right. The developed countries' bank were flush with uh, deposits to give away. Something like this had happened once before after the f first oil crisis of 1973, which, if you remember, that led to complete wreckage of Latin American countries with huge debts and so on. But, you know, that was them, this is us. So, uh, first, first uh, we had this very boastful idea from America, that America is a consumer of last resort. Americans have rode on the White Horse and rescued the world from disaster by borrowing and consuming this money. Mm -hmm. And this is where the next fallacy comes, that all of economics, and again, uh, Bill referred to it, all economics is about flows, income flows, consumption flows, investment flows, not about stocks. The thing about you may consume borrowed money, but you're building up a stock of debt. And after consumption has done all that it can do, you're still left with how you're going to pay the debt back. Okay? So what also kind of fooled the central bankers is that the Asians were not only supplying money, but they were also supplying manufactured goods much cheaper than we had been used to. The analysis of inflation in the 70s and 80s were manufacturing prices were sticky, you know, and you know, unit labor costs were rising and wages were putting pressure. That was inflation. Suddenly, 
The Chinese add 400 million people to the labor force of the world and manufacturing prices stop rising. So a good central banker like Alan Greenspan thought, aren't I smart? There's all this money here, interests are low, but there's no inflation. We have conquered inflation. Thank you very much. The Chinese, Chinese, you know, Chinese don't actually play any role in this because we don't think about these sorts of things. Imports and exports hardly appear in a macro model. So you had a brilliant situation. The Chinese were not only giving you money, but they're making it easier for you to, to spend that money by keeping inflation low. It was like a, like a, like a drug dealer uh, selling you drug, and when you paid him, gave you the money back to buy some more drug. And you know, that's what it So imbalances were created, which were not unforeseeable, but which were not in our intellectual compass. We understood, we understood globalization imperfectly. We didn't really understand how the underconsumption and, and overconsumption tied with the stocks at the top and the flows of manufacturing products, things like that. So having, having got that far, we then had one more problem, which I think is rather crucial. Uh, again, uh, as has been mentioned by Bill, that the dot-com boom collapsed at the end of the 1990s, beginning of 2000s. And what happened was that there has not been any significant industrial innovation in the Western world since the uh, Silicon Valley boom. There just has not been the kind of Schumpeterian innovation to absorb some of the money which was available for investment. So even when the as it were, the market rate of interest was low, thanks to extra credit. The natural rate of interest, if I may use a technical word, either rate of profit, was collapsing very, very fast. So there were no industrial sectors, neither in terms of uh, uh, environmental technology or and any, you know, uh, anything else, which was absorbing all this money. So the money had to go somewhere, and that's why it went into housing. You know, interest rate was, market interest was low enough that you could put the money into very low rate of return activities and still think you would be all right. And that's why a lot of money, not only just in US but elsewhere, when you do housing activities. And that low, that low profitability of subprime housing basically became a problem as soon as market rate of interest rose. This is not rocket science. Vixel said this in late 19th century. I mean, you know, we don't need new economics. We need, we need old economics uh, brought back to us. And so it's a classic Vixel cycle in which rate of profit had collapsed, rate of interest has gone down to just about make it, uh, uh, make it sustainable, and then rate, rate of interest went up due to some inflationary pressures in the commodity markets. The whole bomb collapsed. So in a sense, it was the success of the great moderation, the success of the globalization, which made people take their eye off the ball. They thought it was all smooth, and suddenly people started talking about the law of one price, how the whole globe was a single economy, and, and all that sort of stuff. And it's only when uh, the, the crisis hit in 2007 that we realized that the world was not all just about controlling inflation. But controlling inflation had been a major question of debate in macroeconomics from the mid-1970s onwards. Okay? So those intellectual problems, and maybe another little academic thing, and again this has been said, we never, see, when Keynes gave us a little framework, he gave us a grammar and a language and a story they call it. It's also consumption, investment, money. And a man who had who'd written a two-volume book on, on money in a few years previously, in his general theory, money almost disappears. There's no banks. There are no banks. There's just about money and one bond. And we just took it all seriously. Uh, so the complex, as the, the financial markets are growing in complexity, they're doing some amazing things. But macroeconomics were not absorbing it. 
We just took it for granted. And even now, if you look at sophisticated model, it's, a, it's just one bond, you know, the rest, the rest will be taken care of. Now, what that meant is that the financial interconnectedness, which basically what, what shook us when Lehman Brothers collapsed, when Lehman Brothers collapsed, we suddenly realized that if we, and I'm sure uh, Bill knew this on his uh, day job, the, the financial interconnectedness meant that you break one bank and credit seizes up. Banks stop lending to each other, there is panic, nobody knows what the counterparty risks are, of the assets they hold and things like that. I also think that most people at the top of banks didn't really understand the financial innovations they were putting money into, but that's a lot like that. So, in a sense, there was every reason not to worry. And when we had to worry, we didn't know uh, what the cause of our crisis was. Okay, so that that is that. Me, uh, let me. If I've got a few more minutes, uh, let me tell you the long story. Why did the thing uh, sort of collapse? Not when it did. I think one is, you know, as as uh, Jacek was saying, economists cannot forecast the date by which uh, the boom will collapse, but they can tell you there are systematic reasons why the boom may collapse. We are not astrologers. Uh, you know, we may be astronomers, we certainly are not astrologers. And so, what the, reason, the thing to do is to find out what the structural reasons are. Now, you know, we think Great Depression, 29, and then 45, but psychologically, I would say that the Great Depression did not leave people's psychology till about the late 1950s, early, early 1960s. Nobody could be sure that a specter of uh, unemployment would not return in developed countries till sort of, as, as a student in the 1950s, I had to do a course in business cycles, uh, economic growth and fluctuations it was called. By mid 1960s, that subject had disappeared. No system, no responsible graduate school in, econo in, in economics in America or UK taught business cycles. Business cycles are interesting. And if you want to read business cycles, you have to go back and read Marx or some, some older, older books and things like that. And so we just, we said, okay, we've eliminated business cycle. There's even a book called Is the Business Cycle Obsolete, published in 1965. Uh, so Again, we had confidence that somehow we have eliminated cycles. And then something happened which sort of, again, uh, we, didn't, we didn't see what it was. You see, in the old days, people like Schumpeter used to believe there are short cycles of three to five years, there are long cycles of 10 years, and then there are very, very long cycles of 50 years. The short ones were called Kitchen, the 10 years were called Jugular, and the 50 years were called Kondratiev. Uh, anyway. Uh, and we didn't think in terms of those long cycles. And Conrad Yef is 50 years, 25 years, up 25 years down, roughly speaking. So if, if one were sort of old fashioned, one would say by 1945, at 25 years, 1970, you know, look up your horoscopes and say there is a, there is a crisis coming. Now, I have to say, uh, and this is just in, by way of memory, there is a Belgian Marxist called Ernest Mandel, uh, whom some, of, some people may have heard of, even remember. In 1964, he wrote an article about why, as a Marxist, he did not believe in this Keynesian miracle. And he said, you know, this is going to come to an end. You know, this is a Kondratiev, round about the middle of 1970s, it'll come to an end. He said it 10 years ago before it happened. And by some accident, the OPEC price rise of 1973 is a fundamental breaking point of the old order. The simple gains in economics collapses, we get stagflation. But that is, and I've already dealt with that, but the big thing about stagflation was that wages had risen too high in developed economies, full employment, continuous full employment, and then a lot of manufacturing activity left developed economies and went eastwards. So the shrinkage of manufacturing industry in the developed world started in the 70s 
and you know now China and Korea and all those countries are manuf- in a big manufacturing suppliers and manufacturing employment has shrunk in all the developed countries. What that did was that for ordinary unskilled or semi-skilled manual workers who had a steady source of income, which grew every year due to productivity growth and other things, trade union strength, this bulk of the working class, which was having a stable, slowly rising income, it collapsed. And across Western countries, you either had a large stock of long-term unemployed, if you had a welfare state, or like in America, they had to go into low paid service occupations. This is why inequality has grown. The wage income, the share of wages in national income has not risen and it declined slightly since the mid 70s. In America, the average wage has not risen for 40 years. And the, and the sort of solid supporting bulk you had for a Keynesian sustained thing could only be had by borrowing. The incomes were not being generated for the, um, the majority of the working class. And we have kind of come to an end of that thing. That from 73 on, was one way to think about the world is that the shift of manufacturing from here to there uh, has meant that uh, working class incomes have collapsed. Income inequality has risen. In the financial sector, you, if you are educated and risk taking, you get very highly paid jobs. In the rest of the service sector, you get you know badly paid jobs, and you have persistent unemployment. Welfare states are in a crisis, even in Scandinavia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, and some of this this crisis was hidden by this borrowing from uh, the Asian countries. Now we are confronting, in full extent all those structural problems, which is why, whatever we learn or may not learn from this crisis, the good times are not going to come back. There is no way I can see policymakers in developed countries can generate sufficient savings from their population to meet both the demands of the aging population and so on, plus the needs of the welfare state, plus investment in new productive activities which will raise the wage of the ordinary worker. That is our crisis. You know, whatever we may or may not, how many bankers we may shoot uh, is, is, is neither here nor there. So this is like, in a, like a long Kondratiev cycle and we are caught in the middle of this and it's, it is because of this hollowing out of the Western economies where manufacturing is a very small part of the total, uh, 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 has a very small part of the total economy in terms of employment share, slightly larger in terms of output share. And uh, we really have not been able to find work for the semi-skilled and, and unskilled. And for the next coming generation, we don't know how we will educate them and what we will do. Because in the meantime, Capital is getting cheaper, there's more computerization, more jobs being done, done by computers, and fewer and fewer jobs to be done by, by, by people. Okay, uh, that's enough to depress everybody. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop uh, and, uh, and sum up. I think uh, if the uh, Great Depression happened in 1929 and Keynes wrote uh, his book in 1936, seven years, we haven't yet got that far, but really Keynesian economics did not sink into the profession till about the 1950s. New ideas in economics do not suddenly appear on the spur of the moment, and even if somebody had a bestseller, economists are too skeptical, they're not going to immediately drop everything and suddenly adopt a new theory. There is no new theory in sight, and I don't think there's going to be a new theory in sight, because there are sufficiently old theories available to explain what happened if we only go back to it. The problem is not theory. The problem is in terms of, given the old theories, we have been neglecting the, the big issues of stocks, of debt, the need for savings to finance our elderly care, revamp our education systems, 
and and you know hope something uh, uh, something can happen. Only only hope is that somewhere there is a new innovation, a fifth generation or sixth generation industrial revolution, which will be so fantastic, Star Trek technology or whatever, that it will absorb a lot of saving, generate lots of jobs, and maybe enrich and continue to enrich us uh, in the future. But uh, after what economics has done to you, would you believe an economist? Thank you. Now, does this work? Yeah, it does. Well, thank you very much, Lord Desai. It was not too optimistic conclusion, and I'm very glad that you reminded us about the need of the structural changes. Uh, because that's something what um, seems to be missing from the, from the discussion, not, not today, but in general. Now, to stick with our policy that we do not go with these type of meetings much beyond uh, two hours. We have some 10 up to 15 minutes for the discussion. So who would like to raise the hand, please? Let's see, let me start from the right to the left. So, my friend, Mr. Kinski. Good afternoon and thank you. I don't know if being a friend to a microeconomist is a title of glory, <laughs> Vladimir. Just a quick question, and I'm just an honest to God businessman. I also happen to be rather lazy and not particularly brave. So I'm one of those guys who like the quick fix without too much pain. And if you combine that, the fact that people, institutions always found that they prefer the quick fix, the easy solution out, with the fact that we've been printing money for at least 10 years, like mad, possibly even 17 years, isn't the quick fix unavoidable? And I'm talking about sustainable, durable inflation. Thank you. Thank you very much. There was another person raising the hand behind. Please go ahead. And then I have seen Professor Maestlik on this side, and I will ask the panelists, and we will go to the other side. Yes, please. Rokitka, týdenník občanské právo. Chtěl bych se zeptat na to změna paradigma. Spousta lidí varovala před krizí, že přijde, protože je inherentní tomu systému nekrytých peněz a frakčního bankovnictví. A třeba Marie Rothbard a tyto ekonomové na to upozorňovali, že to prostě takhle dopadne. A východiska jsou dvě, tak buď čistě tržní hospodářství bez těle těch zásahů, a nebo plánované globální hospodářství pomocí internetu, pomocí počítačů, což rozvíjí myšlenku profesor Paul Kokšot z Glasgow University. Tak jak vidíte, dvě teleta východiska. A nebo to půjde dál takovou tou zlatou střední cestou nějakého globálního keynesiánství, ale to asi se nepodaří. Takže jak to vidí panelisté? Díky. In the nutshell, the question is that whether we will really see a shift of the paradigm, uh, whether there will be some kind of a market economy without the intervention, or on the other hand, some dreams about the global planning via internet, or some uh, muddling through uh, the quasi keynesian new policies. Professor may speak, and then I will give the floor to the, to the panelists. Uh, let me just uh, raise a couple of questions, uh, because... Uh, Vem si mikrofon, Michale, prosím. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I had the opportunity to listen to a couple of uh, gentlemen which were here at different occasions, you know. Actually, uh, life is changing. I remember the meeting in Poland uh, when uh, Mr. Jacek Rostovky, on behalf of the ministry, tried to defend uh, his interventionist policy vis-a-vis -vis his former colleagues, Mr. Balcerovic and so on, which is uh, sometimes a difficult issue. And... Uh, uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, if I go back, what I was missing in uh, Mr. White's uh, presentation was uh, the active role of the U U.S. government, because I was also a number of uh, times uh, present of uh, the active role of uh, specifically this housing policy department and so on, which put those thresholds, and I was at that time 
training uh, with uh, U.S. bankers, and I was shocked at that time, and uh, I was shocked even later because they were able to defend uh, actually rising prices uh, generated by, let's say, Greenspan policy and so on, and. Uh, based upon the fact that I, I questioned if you look into the real estate prices growing up and uh, they said no. Uh, your experience from Czech Republic, because we have seen the appraisal, reappraisal of inflated prices uh, here in the Czech Republic in 90s and we had to restructure the banks afterwards. But uh, I, I said, you know, how, how, how can you accept uh, such, a, such a development? And uh, they said the most reliable ratio is loan to value ratio and uh, the re uh, regulators were perfectly happy with, with the point that uh, loan to value ratio is still stable while you know uh, adjustment downwards is much more difficult than upwards and those uh, actually mystic models uh, which are generated by fed uh, uh, i had the opportunity to, to to fight with them even in in 2008 and i was seen as a as a pessimistic eastern european guy you know so so basically uh, you know so I'm coming to the point. So try, try uh, to sum it up, Michal. So the fiscal policies, you know, and interventionist policies at different points, and uh, Mr. Rostovsky actually uh, put uh, such a suggestion uh, forward, you know, uh, can be seen from different uh, faces. So uh, what about then uh, your uh, position vis-à-vis -vis the action? Austerity or growth? What is, what is your position afterwards when you left a uh, 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 role of yours? Thank you. There were many implicit questions in the latest interaction, starting from the distinction between Jacek Rostovsky and the former policies of uh, Leszek Balcerowicz, but I will leave the panelists to pick up whatever they want from these three questions. Who will start? Bill? Um, is inflation uh, the way out of the crisis? Um, I, I think it could be part of a package. I think it's very likely that it will be part of a package whether people want it or not. Uh, the only worry I have on that front is uh, we talk about sort of moderate, sustainable uh, inflation. The question is good luck. You know, if you can pull it off, it's fine, uh, but there's a lot of dangers involved in it as our German colleagues would be the first to point out to us. Um, will the new paradigm be more free market or less? Uh, I'm not really well placed to make a political judgment. I would hope what we will get is more free real markets, because I think there's a lot of cartels, there's a lot of monopoly power out there. Uh, it shows up in the income distribution numbers. Uh, in effect, a lot of people are being exploited so I hope there's going to be more sort of uh, free competition on the real side. I hope that there will be a less free financial sector because I think it's gone far too far. And when Lord Desai was talking about sort of the stable period, uh, well, this picks up on comment both these gentlemen have made, uh, the, the period of stability sort of after the war through until the early 1970s, uh, it was in large part because the banking system was highly repressed and uh, you couldn't get really, really big crises without the financial sector somehow being involved. So without that, all we had were sort of moderate little recessions. And the last question directed to me about the US government to blame in, in pushing subprime. Uh, you know, I had a long list of people to blame and I just sort of ran out of paper. Um, but certainly the US government, the politicians, uh, were very much part of this. As I think I did say, um, as they observed their, their constituents no, not being able to earn the income that they were earning before, the average guy, uh, they too fell into this trap of believing that borrowing was just as good as earning. And so they, they actually put a lot of pressure on Fannie and, and Freddie, uh, basically to make loans that previously would not have been uh, bankable. And that was, a real, that was a real problem and it all came unstuck. So yeah, the, the politicians, they, they, they were on the list as well as everyone else. Um, yes, I, I, I won't answer all the questions because um, 
they've, that's been partly done. On, on the question on inflation, well, really, there are three ways of dealing with this kind of problem of excessive debt, which is not just public debt, but also private debt. There are three ways of dealing with it. One is to have a long period, reasonably long period of growth. The second one is to have a very long period of deleveraging, deleveraging, as the Americans say, which means that we have then a long period of, um, of stagnation or even recession. And the third is to have a long period of inflation. Um, I think obviously we would all like to see it happen through growth. That's really the underlying aim of this discussion. Right, was what do, how do we need to change our thinking to make sure that the way we get out of this is through a period of growth rather than through a period of stagnation, a very long period of stagnation or inflation. But if we don't succeed in doing that, or it doesn't happen by accident, because a lot of good things often happen by accident rather than through intention, then it's going to have to be either a long period of stagnation or inflation. There's, there's not a third way. What about explicit? Um, that, as you have said, is somewhat unlikely. It may happen in particular cases. My own intuition is, or my own understanding is, that bank reduction, uh, sorry, debt reduction may be a way of resolving the problems of particular countries and particular institutions. It's extremely unlikely to happen at a world level apart from anything else, because we don't have world government, and you would need a world government for that. So it'll be a sort of a way of resolving particular um, points where the system is jammed up, but it won't be an overall solution. So for the over and it will allow then either growth or inflation, or, you know, it might allow growth um, if it's done well. Are we likely to have a, an extreme of either extremely free markets or, or world planning? No. Uh, I think what uh, we have learned that um, very far-reaching planning just doesn't work at all. It collapsed uh, totally. I mean, far more than <laughs> the problems we've had in capitalism over the last over the last six years. Um, what I was trying to say was that, and it's a different way of making somewhat of the same point that was made earlier about, uh, by using the idea of complexity, is that we actually have particular situations in particular countries which need pragmatic solutions in the context of what we generally know about the effectiveness of, of markets and the need of, for some degree of government. <laughs> Right, And these solutions will be different depending on where we are in particular countries at particular times. And we should spend more time trying to understand where we really are rather than developing great uh, overarching, overarching theories. Um, on fiscal balance and growth rather than austerity, uh, you need growth to achieve fiscal balance when you've started off with a lot of debt but you need fiscal balance to sustain growth, and we all know that. And the whole issue is how to do it. Um, and just one word to what Megnat said about uh, being pessimistic um, because uh, people in rich countries were going to be not going to get richer uh, very fast. Um, when I was a student, the thing we worried about was that people in poor countries were never gonna get rich, and now we're worried because they're getting rich. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm, I'll just answer questions in general. You know, inflation you know, is not a desirable uh, way out. But you know what I have been noticing in the last four or five years, at least in developed countries, is inflation is very hard to achieve. You know, we were told simple stories about inflation, drop money from a helicopter and there'll be rampant inflation. Hey, what happened? M equals KPY and all that. And the, look, look at poor Abe. You know, he's out of his mind trying to generate some inflation in the Japanese economy. So I think as, as uh, Jacek was saying, we, we, 
every time we think we understood the transmission mechanism, we once again don't understand the transmission mechanism. And then what I wanted to say is, I did, you know, would we all be a libertarian or you know, do it all through our own computers? So on? You know, my thing is, the economy is so complex, always has been complex, that economists have decided they can only understand it by extreme simplification. There is no way of actually mimicking the full complexity of the economy. You know, by the time you've done it, it has become something different. So we think there ought to be a simple answer, you know, magic, you know, price signaling, this and that. And what happens is we always have a, you know, differently weighted combination of a variety of strategies uh, through which we muddle through. Let me give you one more example. The physicists get whatever it is, X billion dollars to smash atoms together, right? We don't even get one millionth of that money to find out whether money causes inflation or not. We're still, we're still wondering about the simplest propositions in economics. Why? Because from today to tomorrow it changes. Uh, as someone says, it is like that apple which is about to fall in Newton's head decided not to fall and go back up one day. Every other day it was falling, that day it decided to go up. That's the state of economics. Uh, we, live, we, we are studying a very complex system. And, uh, you know, so my, my general pessimism is because I don't think that uh, we are yet ready to re-examine where growth comes from. Growth was too easy for a long time, it became too automatic, so we thought it would come naturally. Now I don't know where the growth will come from. For the emerging economies, there are still you know, low-lying fruits to pick up. But for developed economies, it's very steep uphill climb. Oh, and as to austerity and, and things, you know, I think, you know, at least in the UK, I have supported austerity. At least a UK case, I decided that UK will not get itself out of its bad habits by having a Keynesian fiscal uh, expansion. And after three years of, you know, it's not really very hard of austerity, the economy has bounced up from the bottom. It's a fragile recovery, but I think it may just sustain itself if the austerity is kept up. I wish the Czech government and waiting to be sworn in two days, listen to, to your last two sentences. Uh, well, but you know, economics is more and more about modesty. And Meghnad, if I was a finance minister of some very strong, large developed economy, which eventually provides billions or millions of dollars to the physicists for their, uh, for their research, still I would doubt to give the same amount of money to the economists. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Kovanda, and then the gentleman I saw over there, and we will have to probably finish. Lukash, please. Uh, thank you for your excellent presentation. I have one a brief question to Mr. White. Uh, I would like to ask you because you said that Greenspan put uh, led uh, to rising uh, income inequality. So I would like to ask. To which extent uh, we can blame uh, central banks for rising inequality, income inequality, we are seeing uh, right now. Thank you very much. And the gentleman there, please. Yes, uh, I'm Chen, Charles University. And I'm very thank you for your uh, interest in the, uh, the presentation. I have a question for you three. That is, uh, after the economic crisis, so I think the more and more governments, then they got many lessons. For example, they want to, uh, to find a better economic policy, and also they seek for the stimulus of the economic growth. The thing is, uh, you three to speak about uh, the Asia countries rising, and uh, also the China and the South Korea, that has a lot of the mass the manufacturing. And my question is very simple. In this the economic crisis, the war has already to wait for the Asia leading, for example, like the China. Because I have to say, honestly speaking, China is experienced about deal with economic crisis with the rest of the world. But the thing is, probably according to the several documents and the researches is, um, the China economic power probably will replace 
United States. So under the China is experience, the country to deal with economic crisis is the war has already been raiding to deal with the China to deal with the economic crisis. Thank you. Thank you. I think that the patience of the audience is just coming to its limit. So I will take the last question of the gentleman who is raising. Over there, the gentleman was raising the hand. But please be short because we are indeed coming or we are running against the time already. Yeah, thank you. I've got a short question to the um, Minister Jacek Rostowski. Um, the, obvious, the obvious answer for the question how we should fight over the crisis is austerity. But the question is on what we should make austerities on the government by cutting bureaucracy or we should make it by raising taxes and making austerities on the people's budgets, people's home budgets. That's a question I should ask, I, I would like to ask. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And this closing the question period because indeed I see that uh, people are uh, becoming to be impatient. So who will start? I will start this. Bill has no answers. Let me just do two of them. Um, one of them, I, I guess, has to do with this question that was addressed particularly to me about central banks and income inequality. Um, I guess I, I, I believe that excessively easy monetary policy has led to the current crisis. I think that the current crisis is probably hurting poor people and the uneducated more than it's hurting anybody else. And in that sense, monetary policy has contributed to income inequality. Uh, I think as a kind of a joinder to that, there's a lot of people who point out the fact that low interest rates affect, uh, affect, financial budget, affect financial balance sheets. And then the question becomes who gains and who loses. I think people with debts are the poor, and so they're helped by these low interest rates. I think a lot of the debts are held by rich people who have engaged in serious speculation, and so therefore the low interest rates help them. And by the same token, the assets that are on the other side of that balance sheet, their prices have been going up and up. And most of the assets, particularly equity, are held by the rich people. So I think, yeah, there's another link. Second thing, just very generally, and I'm not sure whether this is a direct answer to, to the question, but this whole business about the relationship between the emerging markets and the um, advanced market economies. I think one of the ways that we got into this problem was that every time the advanced market economies had a problem, the central bank said, print the money. And that should have made their exchange rates go down. But the emerging market countries, not least China, the emerging market countries basically said, if you can print the money to get your exchange rates to go down, we can print the money to prevent our exchange rate from going up. And that is precisely what they did. And in the end, we have wound up with this problem of massive overextension of liquidity. If we had an international financial system with rules, that couldn't have happened. But the problem is we don't have an international monetary system with rules. We can have no answer. Yeah, uh, oh, how, how to do austerity? I think, you know, it it's really is a matter of what the electorate will stand. What's the interesting thing in UK has been that uh, what uh, George Osborne did, he took the 2010 budget, the last budget before the election, and said, okay, the budget will be fixed in constant terms and zero growth rate, except for indexing to inflation. Now, since by that time, the, the uh, government expenditure GDP ratio had reached about uh, 49 to 50%, so income growth was going to be zero anyway, if not negative. That was the best thing you could do to, as it were, have as little painful austerity as possible. So what people call austerity is when government expenditure stops growing. That's what they call austerity. Nobody has, in, in the UK, they nobody actually cut government expenditure, but they stop growing. And I think, in a sense, not just UK, but the Western world as a whole, We'll have to really come to terms with this problem. What is going to be the size of the welfare state? Uh, you know, we, we had welfare state when 35% of the GDP was a, sh uh, was a share of government. 
We are a welfare state when 48% of the GDP is share of uh, the government. And we want to go from 48 to 44, people say, my God, this is the end of the world. Hang on. You can't, you know, you have to, as a society, have a big debate as to can you go on doing things like this? Because in the meantime, you have not invested your money into productive assets. What we have done, we have carried a lot of long-term unemployed. We haven't retrained them. We have carried a lot of uh, other sort of people who are trapped in a welfare system. I mean, we had discussions of this in the Labour Party you know, 20 years ago. We didn't reform it. Now, so I think the whole question of austerity and how you do austerity, do you cut bureaucracy, do you cut uh, social welfare spending, do you raise taxes, that is the central question. And a lot of, a lot of political parties are not actually discussing that. And it's not a question of left versus right. Whoever is in power will have to do it. That there may be a little bit of choice here and there, but there is no other choice. You'll have to do it, uh, and we'll have to get back to something like moderate 40 to 41 percent, at least to begin with, before we can see the light of the day. You know, that, that is, that's my belief, and a lot of people are shocked I say this, but you know, when circumstances change, you change your views, as somebody said. And that, that's exactly what I've done. Um, on, um, the, I would, um, I would agree with a lot of what Magnat said. First of all, um, and I can sim and rather than saying what one should do, I'll maybe just say what we did. Um, this year will be the fourth year in which we shall have the lowest ratio of current expenditures to GDP in the history of Poland since the beginning of the transformation. Um, somewhere around 37%. The overall expenditure to GDP level this year will be 40%. Um, and I think that was the right thing to do. But in the short term, when you've suddenly got a problem with credibility, as you do in a crisis, well, sometimes you have to show determination. And the only short way of reducing, when you have to do it minimally, of reducing deficits is sometimes to raise taxes and you have to be ready to do that. So if you have to do that, you do that, but the long-term solution is to keep expenditure under control. And bureaucracy is a fairly small part, actual expenditure on people is a fairly small part of, uh, of government expenditure, but we've managed to contain that and we have one of the lowest uh, numbers of uh, of, of, uh, of people working in the uh, in the in public administration in the in the um, in the European Union. Um, the other thing that that's very important about austerity is timing. Right, you what you need to do is to cut your ratio of uh, cut your deficit in particular. Um, when the economy is growing, not when it's contracting. If you can only do that, if you can only do that. Well, it did in our case. It did exactly in our case, exactly in our case. We allowed it to grow in 2009, 2010. We allowed the deficits to grow very sharp, sharply, and then we reduced them by four percentage points of GDP in two years when we had growth. Of course, it, ha it can happen if you, if you do it properly and uh, obviously, uh, if circumstances are also helpful. So those are the answers. It, it's, Magnad is wrong to say it never happens, but he would be right if he said it's not always possible. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let me just add a footnote to this. When Labour government came to power in 1997, the share of government in total GDP was 36%. When Labour government left, it was 48%, and much of the period was a period of growth. Through growth, we went from 36 to 44. So nobody repairs a roof when the sun is shining. You only repair the roof when it is raining. That is one of the tragedies of politics. You okay. are an exception. <laughs> I don't think that, that, that is so obviously true that it doesn't need a comment. Okay, thank you. Well, um, 
you Poles, you did much better in the relation growth austerity than we Czechs did, but we still are facing a lot of hurdles. Well, we are coming to the end. Uh, I'm a little bit unsure this time, not about the quality of the speakers or their presentations. On the contrary, I think we had one of the best brains in today's economists in the room. What I'm unsure are the conclusions. Uh, listening to Bill, yes, complexity is the word, and modesty, humbleness is the word, and it will be a long time before we will understand the way ahead. But at the same time, people are asking for the uh, quick answers. Uh, nevertheless, I believe that at least it was a good food for thought for all those present and also for all those who have already left. So let me stay here without making uh, this time some longer conclusions, but let me also be very glad that we had such a discussion. Let me thank very much the, uh, the speakers, all three of them, I think they did an excellent job about a very difficult topic. Let me thank very much also our sponsors, FinCentrum, Walmart and KPMG Czech Republic. Let me thank to you that you came and I'm glad to announce that for the year 2014, Prague 20 plans to organize on this level three another meetings in second half of May. We're gonna have, or we should have, because you never know, we should have Jeffrey Sachs together with some other economists and uh, Financial Times commentators. We will a little bit make a tour from the macroeconomics in October um, when we will organize, we plan to organize a large conference about the nuclear energy, not only in Czech Republic, and not only about nuclear power plant Temelin, but more in generally with the international presence. And for December, we might have some surprise. So this concludes the conference. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very, very much for the speakers, and see you next time. Thanks. <laughs>